it's the grief is going to happen in so many ways, not just in literal loss of someone we love. The gratitude is where it's at. It's just, and not, and let me clarify, because I always, I'm always like this. It's not suppressing and saying, oh, let me just brush it under the rug, what I'm feeling. I should be grateful for where I'm at. No, 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 no. You should totally acknowledge where your, your experience is, but saying, I'm grateful that I understand my experience. I'm grateful that I'm able to take a step back and, and see my experience for what it is and not suppress it, not make it smaller. And then everything in between, as you say, the gray in between is just one day at a time, one day at a time. And as you, as you see fit. Hello, and welcome to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. This podcast is about exploring the grief that occurs at different times in our lives in which we have had major changes and transitions that literally shake us to the core and make us experience grief. I created this podcast for people to feel a little less hopeless and alone in their own grief process as they hear the stories of others who have had similar journeys. I'm Kendra Rinaldi, your host. Now, let's dive right in to today's episode. Thank you for listening today. Today, we will be talking to Yolanda Lopez Hagabok. She is a mom and a bonus mom. She is originally from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. She was raised in Los Angeles and now lives in Nashville, Tennessee with her family. She is the founder and CEO of YoFit, as well as the host of Diamond Cuts podcast. And we will be learning a lot more of everything she does, as well as her grief journey and really just how fitness has been one of the biggest tools probably in her toolbox, aside from, of course, all the mindset coaching that you do as well. So welcome, Yo. She goes by Yo, so we'll be saying Yo, Yolanda, <laughs> whatever. And all the Yo, things. Yeah, all the things. As she was saying before, people call her also Yo Fit because that's her account and her kind of, that's your method of, of uh, brand, fitness. Yeah. Your, your brand is Yo Fit. So welcome, Yo. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure and always sharing space with you. I love it. I'm here for it. I am grateful that you're on and it was an honor to meet you when you invited me to be on your clubhouse episode talking about grief and we were connected by a, a friend we have in common, Ana Cristina, that connected us and yes. it was an honor to be on that in that conversation and I'm honored now to have you in this space. Same. So Thank you for having me. <laughs> So I usually even start with asking people, where do you live now? But you already said it in your <laughs> bio. So that so let's talk. How long have you lived in Nashville? So I moved to Nashville in 99. So imagine it was my uh, freshman year uh, or at the end of my freshman year in high school. And so it was a huge culture clash. You're talking about moving from LA. Los Angeles and oh, Inglewood, yeah. California and moving to a place like Nashville, which at that time it was a lot of cows and fields right it's grown so much now but at the time it was like what is this i've entered the twilight zone what is happening so yeah it's been quite a while i don't even know that i can consider myself from la anymore you know because now it's oh, like girl, who's the southern girl who's don't the southern that. girl <laughs> i can't say that because it does if you're telling me i can't say i'm from colombia i'm like man i live <laughs> I've lived in the States well, longer. Well, that's different. That's different. No, that's different. it is not. <laughs> because it's I've lived in the States longer than I lived in Colombia. And I remember yeah. when that wow. when that year when because I moved here when I was 18, close to being 19. And when I had already lived here more than 19 years, it was kind of like, oh my gosh, do I still say I'm from Colombia when like <laughs> I'm you know been here? But really it's just where what what parts of you like where your where heart I, resides. Yeah, well, I mean my heart resides in a lot of different places. I've moved throughout the United States to quite a bit, lived in LA as well as like you, that's where I went to school. But it's the, the part of like who you, who you are, like what do I, you identify yourself as culturally, the food, yeah. all these kind of things, right? So that's kind of what I, what I relate to in, in terms of where I'm from is where same, I was same. brought up. Yeah. <laughs> so you've lived there then since 1999, so in high school, in high school. Tell us about your early teens. You were, you mentioned in your bio that I didn't read right now. You were a single mom at the age of 19. 
So share how that experience really shaped you in who you are now. Yeah. So there was, you know, since we are on this topic of like grief, right? There's, we know that there's so many types of loss. And I think that that initial part of my high school journey was like, what is happening? I remember telling my mom, like, I promise I'm going to be good. Not that I was doing anything bad, but I couldn't pinpoint why this was happening to me, right? At the Mm -hmm. time. And so finally, I think I finally acclimated. I was the only Latina in, in the high school. And it took me a while, right, to feel like I fit in, to feel like I was accepted. I was like a creature to most people. They couldn't understand why I looked this way, why, you know, I was here. They would ask me ridiculous questions like, are you a movie star? Are you in a gang? Do you carry a gun? Is your grandmother a surfer? So needless to say. Oh my God, that was, sounds like the questions I would get coming yeah. from Colombia in the oh 90s. In the 90s. You could imagine yeah. what kind of questions I got. Oh my gosh, yeah. that is so it was there was a lot of that, right? So finally I felt like I found my footing. I'm very thankful to one of my high school principals who sat me down and said, Hey, listen, I know we just met, but I can see right through you. You are so much more than this that you're trying to maneuver through. And that really sat with me. You know, he said, I believe in you. I think you can do this. You don't have to play along with everyone else, right? And so that really transformed. So uh, shout out to Mr. Jenkins. I'll never forget him. Uh, we're still in touch, which is really awesome. Um, and so that really turned everything around for me. And But my senior year, I even though I was excelling, I got honors, I got all the things, um, I stupidly fell in love, right? Like any young girl. And there was a lot of, you know, like this pressure on my end to fit in still. But then on the other side, there was this notion of, hey, this is not what you were taught growing up. You're supposed to wait till marriage. You're supposed to, all these things, right? And by the time I figured it out, it was done, right? It was said and done. And so I was pregnant at 19. I had just graduated high school. And that wasn't like really the the thing that felt like, oh my gosh, what is going to happen with my life? After I gave birth to my son, I probably around five months or so, I noticed that something was wrong, right? Like something was different. Um, I had struggles with postpartum depression that I didn't even know. This is kind of the, the, the type of things that as a Latinx woman, these are not conversations you have with your family about depression and anxiety and, you know, things like postpartum depression, like what is that, right? We're supposed to be tough and just like, I know you just had a baby, but you got it, right? Mm-hmm. And so I experienced a lot of that and I didn't, I couldn't pinpoint what that even was or why it was happening to me and of course on top of that not being with the biological father of my child and them telling me things like well she's probably you know messing around with all these other people how do you know so it was a lot of like what the heck did i just do and so when i started to notice that my son wasn't um you know doing certain things at about five months i was like okay give him time right they always say give him time give him time about nine months old is when I really was like, something is not right. Um, And sure enough, we went through this, to keep the long story short, we went through this whole process to uh, work with a hospital here in Nashville, which is uh, Vanderbilt uh, University Hospital. And finally, we were able to get a diagnosis. Now you're talking about almost 20 years ago now, right? My son is gonna be 19 this year. The information that was available for a diagnosis, which they finally diagnosed diagnosed him with autism, was minute compared to what's available now. Now, when you add a layer of that to being a woman of color, right, to being in, not having accessibility to the same tools and resources as other people, that made it even more like, what is this, right? I remember, um, I've always, I didn't even notice till obviously I really got into wellness and holistic things but I went to go see a holistic um, practitioner that told me, well, you have to remove gluten and you have to do things that we now is like totally normal. Back then it was like, excuse me, what are you talking about, right? So that's kind of how that started where I now had this diagnosis that I didn't know what to do with. And I already felt like a bad mom, right? I already felt like I wasn't doing enough. Like I I didn't, I wasn't equipped to do the right things for him. And then when he finally got diagnosed, it was just like, now what do I do? And so I really 
you know, thought at that time that like my, that was my first loss, I think, now that I can actually like source through that and say, it felt like my first loss was I lost my, my, my adult, my young adulthood, right? My, my youth, where it was like, what did I do? Mm. Right? I, I don't, now I don't know how to take care of this child. And of course, you go through healing through all of that, right? But the, the challenges that, he, that my son has faced through this whole 19 years um, have also been mine. And I think when we're parents of, of children that are special needs, we tend to not want to voice those type of things because we're like, no, it's how it's about them. Right. And it took me a while to really accept that. No, this is also about me. I've also went through it, you know, so that's kind of how it started. I want to say, I want to touch on something there. And there are a couple other questions I have of what you've mentioned, but the part of that comparison grief kind of like that compare his, that because his grieving per se, or his, his journey was tougher than yours that then therefore you minimize what it is for you. And this happens in grief too. Like somebody has, uh, let's, I'll, I'll, let me just give an example. When, when my mom died, one of my cousins was having a really hard time and could not understand even how I was navigating that, that my, the grief journey when he was having a really hard time with with the grief like but how how is it that you you know like i'm not that i wasn't it was just different but it was kind of like this comparing but it's she's my it was my aunt yet i'm feeling this way and that was her mom like how is she feeling that way you you know what i mean like this comparing ourselves and our suffering and then we diminish then well wait a minute i shouldn't be feeling this way because their pain is bigger quote unquote than Mm -hmm. mine and we put that in the back burner and that's a lot of times then what happens, like you said, in care, as a caretaker of, in your case of a son in the, in the autism spectrum, the, the other part I wanted to ask you, you mentioned about him, you know, you starting to go to a holistic doctor and this part of nutrition kind of starting to play a part. Was that your first kind of insight as to how nutrition can impact health when absolutely. you- Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Because here you are at 19, single mom, and you start learning all these things that, okay, if I maybe use less of this and this in him, it could affect his mood. Maybe he can focus more if he doesn't have gluten or if he doesn't have red food coloring or if he doesn't have whatever things. Tell us yeah. about that. So absolutely. I think that that was definitely the first time that I found that there was a whole nother world that I had never been exposed to. Um, growing up Latinx, right? There's a lot of pressure family pressure sometimes to like, hey, you're gaining a little bit of weight. Hey, you're not eating enough. So like, there's never this, and I'm sure we're not the only ones, but I can only speak from my Latinx experience, right? Where there's like this pressure to always look a certain way um, or be a certain way, right? And so I didn't really know other than like fast dieting or things like that, how to lose weight, right? There wasn't really a conversation of these are, you know, foods that help your body or anything like that. So when I got introduced to this holistic doctor that was telling me remove gluten, remove casein, which is found in milk, and that can help heal his gut. I was like, sir, what child is not, is going to go through the world without ice cream and pizza, right? Like those were the things that I thought. And I didn't realize that that was my first exposure to nutrition and well-being. And then of course, through this whole process, I um, had severe depression. There was days that I wouldn't eat at all. There were days that I would eat too much. Right. So that on top of, you know, sorting through what even was postpartum depression, I started to gain a lot of weight and I actually gained a hundred pounds during that time. And then of course, now I'm like, great. Now I'm single overweight with a child that I feel I cannot help. And so that became like, the beginning of something needs to change. Um, and it really happened because one day I came home from work, uh, at the time I was, uh, working at a a restaurant and I would come home, literally take a shower, eat something. And then I would sit down with my son and, and, you know, try to like interact with him because he was nonverbal. He was not interested in engaging at the time. 
And I remember this particular day I walked through the door and he literally turns all the way around from, he was sitting on the floor playing and he says, mommy. And I fell to my knees. I busted out crying. He's looking at me like, girl, why are you crying? <laughs> you know? Uh, and that was the moment I remember hugging him. And as clear as day, as a matter of fact, we still say this to each other now. He said, don't cry. And I was like, what is happening right now from a child that is nonverbal? He would say things, but not anywhere near to what he can do now. And he said, don't cry. Mommy and Devin together forever, like clear wow, as really day. Good. And I knew that that was like an intervention, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're literally destroying yourself. You have lost so much, but you have no idea what is on the other side of this and how much you have to gain and how much mm -hmm. you're going to get from this experience. And I remember hugging him. And that same day I signed up for my Zumba license. I don't teach Zumba anymore. I have my own brand now, but I signed up from, to get my Zumba license. I had never even stepped into a Zumba class. For those of you who are not familiar with Zumba, it's a dance fitness uh, program. And my aunt at the time, she was a Zumba instructor. She kept telling me, you got to do it because she knows that I love to dance. That is my passion in life. And I did it, but it wasn't with the intention to lose weight. It was the intention of saying, I have to make change, right? So I went throughout that whole process. I became um, a dance fitness instructor and that introduced me to uh, wellness, right? To like eating better and learning all the ins and outs of that. But that initial introduction that I didn't even know what, that that's what it was, was when I realized that there was a whole nother world out there that <laughs> I didn't even know existed when it came to to nutrition the impact that health that health and fitness have on our mm -hmm. mental and emotional well-being as well is huge right yes. so how did you start feeling as you started to change your lifestyle started to go to these dance you know zumba classes and stuff what what started to shift within you and how did that start shifting the way you were approaching life and your situation and your dynamics with Devin? So I think that what really happened that I didn't understand then that I clearly see now when I think about my journey and all the things that have happened is that every time I was dancing, for example, right, it was me not trying to mute the pain. It was not me trying to like, move forward it was literally returning to myself i hadn't gone anywhere i was right there right so this is part of what i teach my clients now because nutrition and wellness and weight loss even is so much bigger than just what you eat and how you move there has there's there has to be an alignment of like the mental health the spiritual health i mean all of it needs to align for it to manifest in the body so at the time i had so many things going on that my happy place was to dance, right? So now is one of the things that I use for any type of grief that I might be experiencing is, is doing things that help me feel like myself, right? And of course, then that opens the door for you to say, wow, if I feel this way doing this, what is it gonna feel like if I do a little bit of that, right? And so when I talk about eating to thrive now, right, I'm not talking about weight loss because not everybody's after weight loss. We're talking about literal deficiencies in the body. I started to really get into like deficiencies and like how my body works so that I could help other people understand like this headache you have, it's not because you've been up all night. This is your body literally telling you, hey, I'm deficient in ABC, right? In this case, let's say magnesium or zinc or whatever. And so I think that that's the type of information that in the wellness space or as I like to say, the toxic diet culture doesn't give you because it's not convenient, right? It's not something that they want to share because then we might unlock things that we didn't even know we could, right? So for me, it was about not just looking good because I lost a hundred pounds, right? Through that journey, I lost a hundred pounds. I got, I kicked the, the eggs to the curve, all the things, but that wasn't the end of that journey, right? That was like a bandaid. I had to do deeper digging on how I, I understood my experience. And so I think that that's the first thing is when I did these things, it was about returning to self, not about reinventing myself or any of that. I was right there. I just forgot. Mm. I love that, that part that you said, because we say so much about, yeah, oh, let me go find myself. But you're right. It's just 
reconnecting with who we already know we are and just have forgotten, <laughs> forgotten because right. we've put so many layers and even society has put so many layers. Our upbringing ends up putting a lot of layers. We start even building beliefs that are not even ours based on our surroundings, yes. our family and stuff. So it's then the stripping, right, of these the beliefs. Unlearning. It's unlearning to be able to recover who we are. Now, let's now go into how, okay, so we've talked about just and the reason we started there because this is again going back into your childhood really you're, you're still a bit before 21 I mean you were above 18 but you were still a teenager when you became a mom and then this journey and how, you started then with fitness how did you start learning the part of mindset and life coaching and those parts in that journey um, I think they go hand in hand right I didn't always feel like working out. I didn't always feel like eating the right things. And I think that when we realize that mindset literally holds our hand through those things, then a lot of things can change. So for me, they were kind of parallel. And I'm very fortunate that I did find uh, some sort of support through that journey, right? I did have to do a lot of it my own, on my own rather, but it was kind of hand in hand. And I realized that I could lose all the weight that I wanted to, but if my mind was still thinking about the pain that I had felt, you know, being a single mom in the beginning or the pain that I had felt not knowing what to do with my son, like if I could kept living there, I was never going to be able to see what was in front of me. And so that's kind of how it started. It, it literally started hand in hand at the same time. And I started to listen to a lot of Jim Rohn and like E.T. and, you know, all these things. And I remember what really kind of catapulted me to like start my brand. And I didn't even know. It's like it's, E.T. you're talking about Edgar. You're talking about Eckhart Tolle, right? Or no, I'm what, talking e. about Eric Thomas. Oh, I have never Eric heard. Thomas. Okay. I'm like, you need to look I was him like, up. I'm yes. like E.T. I'm sure she's not talking about listening to E.T., <laughs> the extraterrestrial. So then I'm like, is she no. talking about Eckhart Tolle? Well, the, listen, he was telling us to go home. That. So maybe that's what I needed to do is just go home <laughs> and pack it all up. Well, maybe, yeah. Maybe E.T. <laughs> was really wise. So Edgar yes. Thomas is it, this other is person? Okay. Eric Thomas. Eric, Eric Thomas. Thomas. Okay. Yes, Eric Thomas. I was listening to um, all kinds of different people that were really in, like instilling this new world in me. Again, going back to those are not things that we hear growing up normally, right? that people were telling me, hey, you you have a choice in how you feel when you wake up in the morning. And I thought I was supposed to feel based on what I experienced the day before versus that day is over and how can I feel now? So I think that that was, I think tool number two for me was in, in all of the grief and loss that I've had is, is grounding myself in what is in front of me right now? What can I, especially when we talk about gratitude, right? It's like, what can I, realize um that is that is here for me and one of the the things that i really took on from a very very early i say not really age but experience age if you will like right when all that transformation was happening was gratitude me understanding that if i wanted to and i remember hearing this a long time ago that if i wanted to really experience like the fullness of life that I needed to ground myself in gratitude because that's where it was that gratitude was going to turn everything that I thought I didn't have and turn it into more than enough that that is where I was going to find the acceptance that I kept wanting from everyone else that it was all already inside of me that that acceptance of my experience that acknowledgement of my experience was only going to be grounded by gratitude it was going to turn the chaos into order. It was going to turn the confusion into clarity. It was going to turn, you know, a meal into a feast. I mean, it was really going to give me that certainty that everything was happening for me versus to me. And that my failures were really my successes, that everything was in perfect timing, that my, my mistakes didn't define who I was or the people that I had lost 
um, in relationships, for example, I, that was another layer of, of what happened during this time because my, my business at the time was wellness related. It grew tremendously. And just like anything else, there's, you know, selfishness going on. There's um, envy. There's all these, like, you give this person more time than me, like all those kind of like silly things that happen. And at some point it, you burn out, you're like, you know what, I don't want any of this. And so all those losses were really just placing me in the right, in the right direction to have the brand that I have now. I think about if I would have stayed there, yeah, I would have been successful and whatever, but is that really what I wanted? And so for me, it was always like, again, grounding myself in gratitude and realizing that that was the only thing that was going to bring me peace. I always think about my, my son, even now as that he's an adult. And I see, for example, people out walking with their caregivers or that are obviously not their family. And I immediately go there. I immediately think, wow, how grateful am I that I'm bodily, mentally, emotionally, energetically capable of taking care of him? Because who is going to take care of him like I take care of him, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what you're saying right there, that responsibility, especially as a parent, because when I also started my wellness kind of route myself, was really thinking of that fact that I did not want to be a burden on my children, right? It's like mm -hmm. I, it, it, as I started to age, I want to be able to be healthy myself. And here with you on on this, on, on in your story, is the fact that you need to be able to take care of your child for as long as, as you can, and yeah. he can live pretty much as you know and as as you as long as you possibly can so therefore your health is your wealth because it gives you that wealth and value of time and capability to be with him and also and also is like because obviously when we experience anything that is traumatic or or just heavy on us right we when we people are like well you have to take care of yourself so that you can be there for your it's also obviously to be there for him literally like he needs me but also to be there for myself I had to also unlearn that it was only for him mm -hmm. like you were like no I want to be here forget about like also being here for our families but like do I want to be well for myself mm -hmm. right and it and it came with a big package of unlearning a lot of things because again when we talk about wellness we think that it has to look a certain way and so in maneuvering through so many phases of loss, it was just more so about what feels good to me, what makes sense to me, and what am I energetically capable of taking on right now? And if that is, I can only go and take a nap because that's where I'm going to feel better versus forcing myself to do a workout that's just going to deplete me more, then I'm going to choose the nap. I couldn't do that before, right? And that's what I, I, I like plant my feet on now with my clients. It's like, no, we're going to look at all of the parts of what wellness is, not just how you're eating or how you're moving. So important. Okay. Now in this journey, you've gone through a lot of other losses. So with your son, Devin, aside from that aspect, of, like you mentioned of your loss of your childhood for some extent, or what your mm -hmm. teenage years or twenties were going to look like, you also, there was also loss of dreams to some extent as well, loss of certain things that you were not probably going to see your child do, right? Yes. right? So those are other types of losses. And when we were on, on when I was on your clubhouse um, episode, we talked about this various types of losses. Now you've also experienced grief from the death of a lot of your relatives. How, and I, we won't, it's been all your grandparents and uncle, and especially one of your grandparents that you were really close to as well. So how has all the experiences that you've had in your journey helped you and supported you as you grieve? And what have you added to your toolbox in that process? And what has also, I'm adding, I'm, at, I'm, ask, I'm asking a lot of questions all at once. And what has also surprised you about yourself in that process? I think that uh, the first thing is I didn't really understand loss 
right? That was my first time when I lost my, my grandfather last November was the first time that I actually lost someone that I was close to. And then, like you mentioned, then it was like Jan, I mean, February and March, I lost my, both of my grandmothers back to back. So that was obviously tough. But I think that it, the first thing was recognizing that um, all of the things that I thought grief was supposed to be like, because of what I've seen other people say or experience, right? When I got to experience it for myself, I realized that I had the opportunity to choose what my grieving process was going to be like. And I know that that's like a lot of people are like, no, well, it comes in waves or it just comes up. Yeah, that still happens, right? But I made the decision from, I guess, even from the beginning of the pandemic that all of the choices that I was going to make were going to be based on my influence versus everybody else's perception of influence of my choices. And so it really surprised me that, um, that I was able to do that, that I was able to take this, I mean, I would call it a tool, right? This like clarity of saying, how do I want to grieve? And, and all of them were different. Like with my grandfather, I was still, and we were really close. I was still able to, well, not able to, but I chose to still do open clubhouse rooms. I needed community. I gave myself permission to ask for help. I gave myself permission to say, I'm not okay. I need people around me instead of closing out, right? With my grandmother, um, and then maybe because both of them, you know, kind of happened back to back, it was kind of the opposite. I canceled a lot of classes. I didn't do as many clubhouse rooms. I needed to be more so, you know, in, in like rest mode because I was exhausted by then, right? So I think that that's what really surprised me that I was able to not subscribe to like an idea of what grief needed to be like. Um, and that also counts for people that I lost that they're still alive, right? We have that type of grief too, that are like, it felt like they died, but they're still here. Um, and really just saying, am I going to, because of this pain, am I going to close my heart off to everything else that's knocking on the door, ready to hug me, ready to pour into me? And I think that that was also surprising, that it was very similar, whether they had actually passed or not, that I was able to say, no, I will not put up that wall. And I, I live by a quote that says, the same wall you put up to protect yourself, is the same wall that keeps all the good out or all the blessings out or all of the good relationships out, whatever you want there to be on the other side, like it's, you're blocking it. And so I, I think that that was really surprising for me that I was able to maneuver in a way that I knew was true to myself versus, oh, my mom just lost both of her parents. I need to be crying and falling out with her. No. And I also didn't need to be strong for her, right? My experience was mine and her experience is her. And I think that in the beginning, when I first started to be like, oh no, how do I support her? How am I? And I was like, er, stop, stop, you're doing it again, right? So these are things that you unlearn in another way. And when they become present in this way, you're like, what do I want? And some people might even say, well, that's kind of selfish. It wasn't your parents, but I also loved them, but I also cared about them. So it was important for me to acknowledge my personal experience and to really say, what do I want moving forward? Not, with, not even going to the extent of saying, what did my grandparents who are now past, what did they want me to feel like? No, you know, the, we, people say things like, oh, they would have wanted you to be happy or they wouldn't have wanted you to cry, right? No, they would have wanted me to make my own choices. And so for me, that was super important in all, in all of it. Now that I look back at everything, it's like even choosing to, even to this day, still being in, in quarantine to, to be as responsible as possible for my son, as far as him being immune compromised and saying, okay, what do I want, right? I, I can't control my husband. And I mean, we live in the same house. I cannot control my husband. I cannot control my parents. I cannot control, all I can do is voice what I need, voice how I'm feeling and why I'm doing things and then make my choices for myself. And I think that applies to all, all sorts of loss and grief is like what do i want what do i feel and for me that's been probably the most important thing is really making room for 
for acknowledging my actual experience versus what everybody else is telling me I should be. That is so important, that perspective of really having that clarity of your own, you know, your own choices. And within that, you mentioned then, of course, losing people, even though they haven't died, but it's as if they have just because you lost relationships and things like that as well. And that is something that we all experience some shape or form throughout our life, uh, our lives, right? We are going to lose friends. And that is a loss that sometimes is not seen or, you know, a grief that probably is not validated through society. But when with these people, what they represent in our lives has been different stages in our lives that we've gone through, or like you were mentioning before, if you have certain ideas of what this, you mentioned off mic, of what this person or these people were going to be in your life in the future, Can you dive into that a little bit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I think that we, where we, not necessarily make a mistake, but where we fail to acknowledge what's in front of us is that we start to make plans in a way that we think our life should go, right? Instead of literally living in the right now, what is my experience right now? And so for me, and of course, rightfully so as a mother of someone who is going to need assistance for the rest of his life naturally i think of like if something were to happen to me who could step in for me and truly with all their heart be kind to my son like i am to be patient with him to be understanding of his experience right and so for me this this particular person was i was very very close to almost like blood like and that was in my head you know that this person would be someone who could take on being me if something were to happen to me. And so when we had that fallout, where we, you know, broke that friendship off, it was like, now what, you know? And of course I have family and stuff, but it was still part of that. Now, what do I do? And it was difficult. And it almost makes me um, think about, things like I shouldn't have given that much trust, right? You start to think of those things like I shouldn't have opened my heart so much. I shouldn't have given them so much uh, insight into my life or, you know, you start to really doubt your choices. And now when I look back at that, I don't have those feelings anymore because again, it was like, those were the right choices at the time in that moment. And that loss hurt just as much as when the people in my family passed away, right? Because you think about all of the good times, you think about all of the, all of the energy and effort that you put into these relationships. And I remember reading um, from one of my favorite books. Um, it's, it's by Bianca Sparacino and it's called A Gentle Reminder. And she talks about how just because that has ended doesn't mean that you shouldn't be grateful for the times you did have that those are the moments that really help you recognize what true love of any kind you know friendships romantic what that really looks like and it puts you into a place where you can really appreciate what you desire what good relationships look like to you or what your needs are, what you deserve. And so I remember reading that and being so like, like a, like a release, like a, like a big gasp for air and saying, I've done it right. I, it didn't make sense. I was just going with what my heart needed. Right. And not closing myself off to new relationships, all those things. I was like, no, I'm going to do what feels good. Even if they break my heart again. Right. Because then I get closer to the people that, will really love me fiercely that really will be there no matter what and so i think that's been a huge lesson in in losing someone who who is still here but not in my life anymore and it helps you forgive yourself it wasn't even about forgiving this person or making room to say if somebody messes up i'm gonna forgive them no this was more about forgiving myself 
even in the losses of my grandparents, there was a lot of, well, I, they were down the street for those three years that I decided to stay as quarantined as possible. I could have seen them. I could have made, I let all of that go. I put all that in the trash and say what my experience was in the moment, that's what my right choices were. And I forgive myself for anything that I feel I could have done different. And what you, that, that, that you're sharing right now goes so much into the aspect of parenting, tag, tying it back to the parent. Every choice we've made in that moment yes. was the right choice because we made it with the tools and knowledge and information that we had at that moment. And we cannot judge ourselves even in that experience of our choices as well. So it goes for everything. And it's again, being, it goes back to what you were saying before, just being really present with what is in front of me right now. And that that's kind of like what you, what you do, right? Yeah. And also knowing that there, I guess we get this note, like this idea from people of, you just got to push through. You just have to make it through. Right. And I'm learning that there is no other side. <clears throat> there's no end, there's no pushing through, but rather absorption, like really just understanding what's happening and making, again, choices and sense of what you think, acceptance of like this relationship ended and that's that. I always tell my clients when we do, of course, like all of our personal development stuff, I say, you don't need closure. We don't need to know why things happen. You don't need to know why this relationship ended. We don't need to know why this person passed. It doesn't change what is. It's grief is not something that is, that you just complete. That's like, here's the beginning. Here's the end. There's days where I miss this person and say, man, we had some really good times. Right. And then it, it, at the same time, it helps me be grateful for the people that are in my life right now and how we share experiences. And it has all, honestly made room for me to be more intentional with my relationships. Right. And, and seeing what part of this do I learn from Not What part did I have in it? Because we're always trying to blame someone or ourselves. Right. And that's a lot to carry. So just saying, what is that, what is it that I can do to understand that this is not um, the end, that there's going to be so much more ahead of me. And, and when we talk about actual loss, it is part of life. Um, so I think that for me, I know that there is a lot of, or has, there has been some fear for me on especially with death around my son and like, am I going to go first? Is he going to go first? Is he going to be okay if I do go first? What does he going to understand that I'm not coming back? And for how long is he going to have to deal with that? You know, or the other way around, am I going to really say, okay, he's gone now, now what? Because this is an, an identity now. So there's a lot of, definitely a lot of fear and a lot of heaviness when it comes to that, but then I, I lean on my tools, right? And say, live, live now. What is in front of you right now? Don't miss out on what's now because you're so worried about all the things. And of course, yes, having things in place. But yeah. that mindfulness, right? Is that mindfulness of that mindfulness is really going back to exactly. being in that present. And still, of course, moment. working through mm -hmm. like, okay, have this in place or do I know who and all those things. Oh, and and to be honest, those things are still very slow moving. It's a it's a difficult space to to maneuver in. And it's important to give yourself some grace, right? We say that very lightly. But what I mean by grace is saying what I can take on today. That's all I can take on today. And being okay with that forgiving yourself for not being able to be superwoman or superman and taking all these things at the same time. And that took me a while to unlearn that it was okay to rest, that it was okay to say no, that it was okay to cancel, that it was okay to say, hey, we'll, we'll just have to do this another day. And it took a minute, but now that um, I'm here, it makes it a lot easier to navigate through loss and, and grief. And 
that I think is why I immediately fell in love with the name of your podcast and everything that you do because it was like it's the grief is going to happen in so many ways not just in literal loss of someone we love the gratitude is where it's at it's just and not and let me clarify because i always i'm always like this it's not suppressing and saying oh let me just brush it under the rug what i'm feeling i should be grateful for where i'm at no 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 you should totally acknowledge where your your experience is but saying i'm grateful that i understand my experience i'm grateful that i'm able to take a step back and and see my experience for what it is and not suppress it not make it smaller and then everything in between as you say the gray in between is just one day at a time one day at a time and as you as you see fit yes so so perfectly said i could use that as my (laughs) little uh promo for my podcast is your your definition of the grief gratitude and the grain between the the part that i feel is also so important and you've mentioned before of having grace and that combination with grace then the non-judgment of ourselves how does not judging ourselves in our process play a part in your life and then the judgment of others for me it is about understanding that when i get validation from everyone else that is not going to change who i am so if somebody tells me oh you're so great and somebody tells me you're not so great it doesn't change who yo is so i had to detach from that i had to unlearn worrying about the approval of everyone else and the judgment. I remember hearing someone say once, the biggest judgment that we get in life is self judgment. But because we're operating Mm -hmm. from a place of what we think others think about us. So that's why we end up in this judgment of like, you're not enough, you're not handling things well, you could be doing more, you should have done this or that or, you know, and for me, it's been literally about detaching from that approval of others. Not that it doesn't feel good, right? When people are like, you're so great. I love being with you or I love what you do. That's fantastic. But do you believe that? Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things to, to always say is what I know about myself, no one, and I mean, no one can use against me. But if you don't know yourself, if you don't know what the truth is about yourself, then someone will always take advantage of that and judge you right i have purple hair i flip my hair when i dance it doesn't make me any less or more valuable or professional or knowledgeable than the person who doesn't do those things and i've been almost caught up in those things and so i refuse to lose myself speaking of grief i refuse to lose myself in this judgment of what the world wants me to be because i've been there and all I experienced was grief. All I experienced was loss. I was losing myself. So that's why I said there's this whole thing about mm-hmm. returning to, to self is so important to me is because I'm not lost. I always say, I saw a quote once that said, you're not a $10 bill in a, in a winter pocket. You weren't lost. You're right here, <laughs> right? Um, and I, I've used things like I'm gonna reinvent myself or I'm going to um, you know, do this or that. And now it's about how do i return to myself what can i do and i think that's been a a huge tool and why it's been so important not to be so judgmental of myself is to say what can i do now even through this pain that i'm feeling that makes me feel like myself naturally we want to go to well being with this person or fixing this problem or going back to my youth right but that's because that's the superficial, that's like what we, society tells us to do. But if you dig a little deeper and say, if I just go outside and skate like I did once and it made me happy, that's it. Or maybe I can call a friend that I haven't spoken to in years, whatever that is, right? For me, it's always dance, that's my happy place. Uh, but there's so many other things, right? Just being still sometimes is, is healing. Just taking it all in. Um, I said it before, there's, it's not about learning to push through. It's about absorption and acceptance of what is and maneuvering it through that. Mm. I say, there's no overwhelm. 
when we feel when we feel overwhelmed and in my book for me what has helped me is to say i'm feeling all of my life's purpose at the same time and i don't know how to sort it yet you know <laughs> it's about relanguaging <laughs> <laughs> it is so true. Okay, so yeah. say that because yeah. that overwhelm that I okay, so I'm feeling all Purpose, of my all life's one time. purposes. All of one time and I do yeah, not know. And how I don't to know how to sort them. it through just yet. You have to add the just yet. Yeah. Or even prioritizing the sorting and prioritizing, okay, like what which one should I do first today? Right. Like you know, today and but tomorrow the priority might be different the you know this one might be first like you were mentioning before if a client's needing rest or is there or they're needing exercise that moment which one takes priority in that moment for your whole well-being in your goals and and, and so forth so no oh, that is that is also i'm gonna have to write that one down because it, sometimes i'm like where do i even begin and then of course we go into this um, what is it when you just basically procrastinate when there's like so much that then you're like paralysis by analysis, yeah. basically like, okay, I guess I just won't do it then because I do not know where to begin. And you know what? And sometimes when we so. end up there, I, I always think of it this way. You know, you're like, I'm feeling kind of off, right? Like I feel off. I feel like I can't just grasp anything. I'm, I feel kind of off. Maybe because that's what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be turned off. You're supposed to go sit down and be mm. still and absorb and let things just be. And we always want to be doing something to fix the something that we don't even know what we're fixing. We don't know what we're. So sometimes, you know, that's when we say when you take a day off, well, you take a day off, right? You turn off your computer, you don't answer phone calls, you don't answer emails. So if you're feeling off, it's because you need to be off. If you all of a sudden are like, I don't I don't want to do anything. It is literally healing. Your body is like, hey, I need a minute. It's all energy. It's all source. It's all relanguaging. It's all like, where, where or how can I look at my life? What perspective can I give into my life of what's happening right now? Acknowledging how you're feeling, acknowledging the, that experience and saying, am I really struggling? You know, I always, how are you doing? Surviving, why? Why do we keep subscribing to this idea that we always need to be suffering, right? Oh yeah. Oh, and you're talking yeah. man in our culture it in general it, and again, these are all generalizations yeah. probably made by our own experiences. But that oh, I know. Yeah. Pues yeah. no, aquí <laughs> yeah. Yeah. viendo cómo right. sobrevivo. You know, it's just all this, you know, woe is me type of mentality that sometimes we we subscribe to as well that yeah. we don't have to. We don't have to. Oh my gosh, yo, we could keep on talking, <laughs> yes. girl, forever. It's so many because we there's so many layers, as we said, even just that we've had to unlearn, and there's so many layers now here and even your conversation as well. So thank you for sharing so much. My so much. There's so many nuggets, so many nuggets that people are gonna take from this. So how can people reach you, connect with you, and work with you, listen to you? Please share with them. And of course, you, you're going to send me all the links yes. that I'll attach then to the profile, to the bio yes, here. The easiest so way us. to connect with me is to go to my website. It is I am, as in I am, yo fit, just like my brand. So Y O F I T uh, dot com. So I am yo fit dot com. And then you'll see all of the things that I do. All of the links to all of my socials are there as well. So that'll be the easiest, most fastest way to get to me would be to um, go to I am yo fit dot com. Perfect. Perfect. And that is for everything, mindfulness, life coaching, fitness coaching, wellness coaching, right. all of the things, a holistic approach to all life, of all of the above, a holistic approach to, to well-being. Yo is your girl. So My thank pleasure. you so thank much. You. And thank you also to, to Devin for being yes. part of your journey and teaching you and, you know, growing alongside your son to then now you sharing your experiences with others and your no, growth. Thank you so, so thank very you. much. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again so much for choosing to listen today. I hope that you can take away a few nuggets from today's episode that can bring you comfort in your times of grief. If so, it would mean so much to me 
if you would rate and comment on this episode. And if you feel inspired in some way to share it with someone who may need to hear this, please do so. Also, if you or someone you know has a story of grief and gratitude that should be shared so that others can be inspired as well, please reach out to me. And thanks once again for tuning in to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. Have a beautiful day.